Right everyone, thanks for joining me once again. I'm Martin Castellan, I'm a landscape photographer based in London. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the three camera bodies that I recommend as secondhand purchase online or from a camera store that you know that I think would be great for landscape photography. Now all these cameras that I'm going to mention I have used in some way or another, I either borrowed them from a friend or I've bought them myself and owned them in the past. Okay, so the first camera we're gonna talk about is gonna be one where you'll probably dismiss it as soon as I say it, and it is the original Sony A7, the kind of Mark I version. So the first camera is the original Sony A7, and I've got one here. I bought this and practically forgot that I had it. Um, but it's actually a really good camera for landscape photography. And I'll tell you why, and you shouldn't underestimate this one. There's a few reasons why this is particularly good. The first one is the sensor that's in it. I think it's the same sensor, maybe slightly differently modified, but it's, it's in the D600, which means it has a ton of dynamic range. It's really got a lot, which is useful for landscape photography, where we're ISO 100 most of the time, it makes a really big difference. So it's got a very good sensor in it. One of the other benefits from it as well is that it's got this tilt screen on the back, and I'm starting to really appreciate and like the idea of having a tilt screen on the back of cameras for landscape photography. It makes things a lot easier. It's nice to be able to shoot at waist height or lower and tilt the screen like this. And I'm not particularly bothered about it going down. And when you put the tripod base things on, they don't really go down properly. But the ability to do this, to flip it so you can see from above is really cool. Now whilst the Sony menu systems, especially on these early cameras were hideous, actually for landscape photography it doesn't really matter because we'll just set up one dial for aperture, one for shutter speed, and the wheel on the back for ISO, and that's it, you're done. There isn't really anything much else to set other than if you want to do some bracketing, you can remember where that is in the menu system and that and you're good to go really so you don't have to worry about the complicated menu systems a couple of other advantages with this is that it's really light that means that it's um a nice lightweight camera in your backpack you can adapt all different sorts of lenses to it so if you like a canon lens or a nikon lens or various manual focus lenses you can adapt them with different adapters which are like these parts here. You don't have to get an expensive adapter. You just need to get one that has an electronics contact through so that the shutter speed, uh, sorry, the aperture dial will work. Um, but you can get like this one here is for Canon. It's a com light adapter. And I got it for like 35 pounds, which is like $45 probably, something like that. And it's cheap and it's no good for the autofocus, but I manual focus anyway when I'm doing landscape, so it doesn't matter. All I need is that aperture control. So you can get an adapter that's relatively cheap and then you can shoot whatever lenses you want to. So it's really flexible in those regards. Now there are some downsides with this camera. Um, one of them being is the, the battery. The batteries that go in them are really small and they don't last very long. I would say that from my experience, when I have used this in the past, which is years ago now, was that third party batteries, which you buy, like other brands, like off-brand batteries, are terrible in cold weather. Now, it may be that where you live that doesn't affect you, but for me it's a big deal, and that means I'm kind of stuck more to the sony own brand ones. Um, but one thing you can do with them, which is an advantage, is if you go on eBay, you can buy these tiny little chargers, which take uh, two of them, they're really small, and you can plug that into a USB power bank, and then just kind of chuck it in your backpack charging, hope it it's best to tape it together so that the um, battery doesn't fall out of the charger, but you can kind of charge on the go like that so you can get more power. I think it depends on how long you're going for and whether you're prepared to have a charging strategy like that, then it can be worth it. Um, what it does give you though, is for a relatively low price point, a very flexible camera that can take lots of different lenses from different systems. That has a really very, very good sensor in it for landscape photography with enough megapixels. I think it's 24, but the dynamic range is, is fantastic on it. So it's a really good camera and you get that tilting screen on the back, which is really nice to have. So I actually think it's really good. And I have been, I must say, I have been tempted to perhaps revisit this camera, which I completely forgot that I owned. Um, so I'm tempted to kind of revisit that and have a look at it again. Okay, the next camera I'm gonna talk about briefly, which I think is a good 
cheap purchase if you want to get into photography and you want to get into that system is a Canon 5D Mark II. The reason I'm going to say the Mark II as opposed to the 3 or the 4 is that the price of the 5D Mark II used is really low. I personally think that the 5D Mark III doesn't offer a landscape photographer a great deal over the 5D Mark II. I think that the 5D Mark IV does, but if you're going to spend that kind of money, I would go for the EOS R or a Canon mirrorless camera instead. So we bring it down to a lower price point for people that are trying to get into photography. I think the 5D Mark II is a really good camera. It has nice bracketing options for bracketing or exposure. It doesn't have a ton of dynamic range, but the 5D Mark III doesn't either. And it's no, it's no, but if anything, I think it's probably a little bit worse. Um, not in terms of the numbers necessarily, but in actual practical handling, when you get the files into your editing software, I've preferred the files from the 5D Mark II for landscapes, but both of them are completely capable cameras. It's just that I don't think that the Mark III offers much over the Mark II for landscapes. Now, if you shoot portraits and you shoot weddings or anything else where there's people, the 5D Mark III definitely has the focusing system and the ISO performance that's of a huge benefit, and it's a really good camera then. But if you're just looking at doing landscapes and maybe the odd portrait here and there, I think the 5D Mark II is a really solid choice. It has a good screen on the back of it. You've got live view exposure on the back where you can see your exposure before you take it. It has a nice ability to punch in zoom so you can see with your, where you're focusing. You can scroll around and look at those uh, exactly what you're focusing on and make sure that it's sharp when you're manually focusing. It takes the current Canon batteries, which are very good. They're very good in the cold. They last for a long time. Uh, they're high High performance, high performance batteries, and of course you have access to Canon's entire range of lenses which are really good quality lenses. So I think it's another solid buy. The only things that let down the 5D Mark II for me is only really one area for landscape photography and then it has, a, it has quite limited dynamic range. Now if you're prepared to bracket your shots and blend your exposures together, which you could just do automated in Lightroom, then that changes everything and it opens up all the possibilities again that you, that you work working in high contrast environments and landscapes give you. If that's not an issue for you, then I think the 5D Mark II is a solid choice. I had the 5D Mark II for a long time, a very good camera, very reliable workhorse. It's worked in all conditions and it's really been tough. It's been rained on, snowed on, hailed on, everything. And it's really just gone and gone and gone and gone and gone. It's very, very good. So you're getting a reliable system with Canon. Only other downsides I can think of is that if you do want to use it for other types of photography, it, whilst it's very capable still, it really lags behind, especially in the focusing department. The focusing, you're pretty, pretty much stuck with the center focus point as being the only one that's reliable. The outer focus points are like little dots, but they're, the reliability of them is really poor and it's hard to trust them, especially if you want to use uh, wide aperture lenses. And with the 1.2s and 1.4 lenses, you can kind of almost forget it. It's really unreliable. If you're using F4 zooms though, they'd probably be okay for that. And I think they'd be much more reliable and you'd be okay. And the focusing and low light's not particularly good either. But like I said, if we just bring it back to landscapes, I think it's a very good camera. I don't think you'll have any problems with it, as long as you'll work within the limitations of its dynamic range, which isn't that great. Okay, and the final camera body I'm gonna to recommend to you, which is probably a little bit of a push up in price, but <clears throat> they're coming down now on the used market, is a Nikon D750. Now the D750 is a nice smaller DSLR camera body, but the, the size of it means that the weight comes down slightly, but it has the tilt screen on the back, and it's a camera that I used for around six months for myself for, I actually used it for wedding photography, but I thought it was a really good camera. It's got live view, it has a tilt screen, it uses Nikon's batteries with, which last a long time. It's a smaller camera body. It's a little bit more expensive than the others, but it has really good dynamic range. As far as I know, it's still working off the same sensor family as that's in the A7 and the D600 uh, and so on. And But it, it, it's been sort of tweaked and it works better now. And I think that the I think the D750, if you look at it all round, gives you a really good package for landscape photography with almost no weaknesses. Actually, it's hard to say that there's anything particularly wrong with that camera. It even has dual card slots, so it's got lots of things going for it. 
It's nice that it uses SD cards, they're easy to get hold of. The screen on the back is really clear and bright. The menu systems are fairly straightforward. There's loads of lenses available for it. The batteries are easy to get hold of and they last for absolutely ages. Now, as a bonus, I would say also within the Nikon camera range, you could look at the D800, perhaps that's a little bit cheaper. That's pretty much just as good as the D8, uh, D750 for landscape photography, perhaps even better, but to my mind, it loses something in terms of the weight and size of it. It's a really large camera, although it'll be very tough, but it, it loses out for not having that tilt screen, which I do start to think more and more is just a really nice feature to have for doing landscapes. But having said that, if you're not, if you're not bothered about the tilt screen on the back and then a little bit of extra weight's okay for you, the D800 is a really solid option. And if you don't care too much about that tilt screen, it may actually be even better. It has a higher megapixel count and it's a, definitely a, a tougher body. It's very, very strong. And you might find that the use prices on D800 are a little bit better. Now, I'll just throw in a note of caution as well, because if you do start to look at those cameras, one other camera body that's gonna come up uh, when you're looking around online is gonna be the D600, D610, which is a camera that I also own. The only problem with that camera, and there's only really one, is that it doesn't have live view on the rear screen. And it really is worth remembering that because there aren't many cameras for even from that time when the camera came out that didn't have live view. And it was one of those things where because video wasn't such a big deal, it kind of, people knew about it, but it kind of flew under the radar a bit. It wasn't, people weren't that bothered about it at the time when it came out. But now it, it's one of those features that you just automatically expect that you can see your exposure on the screen before you take it. And the D600, D610, you can't do that. So you, what you have to do is you have to take a photo and review the photo on the back and then make adjustments accordingly and keep taking pictures until you've got the what you think is the correct exposure. That just slows the process down. I don't think it's necessarily a really big deal at all. And I think that if, you're, if you don't care about that, then the D600 is a brilliant, brilliant camera for doing landscapes on. Uh, I, I wouldn't see any issues with it whatsoever if that doesn't bother you. But that's really the key. You have to think for yourself whether that's an issue for you or not. But then saying that, if you're working at a really slow pace that we normally do in landscapes, who cares if you have to take a few test shots beforehand to gauge your exposure? Does that really matter? No, I don't think it does. But I also do think that there is something to being able to see the picture before you take it on the screen on the back. It makes the process uh, maybe easier, a little bit nicer. But you, what you'd get with the D600 is pretty much all of the other features that you would get from the other Nikon cameras that you get a fantastic sensor, tons of dynamic range, um, really good image quality, uh, reliable body, not as reliable as a D800, but you're not going to have any problems with something like a D600. But I would wrap this up by saying that you should always bear in mind that when you're picking a camera body, you are buying into a system. That means that you're thinking about like, if you're going to buy other lenses, it's worth looking at the lenses that a manufacturer makes to see are these the lenses that I want to be investing in as time goes by? Or do I want to be investing in perhaps something else instead? Perhaps something else appeals more. Anyway, I hope you like that. Please like and subscribe. That'd be great. And take care. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.